Welcome back to a screenwriter's journey, day 81, August 15th. So I'm doing a lot of voiceovers uh, in the last few days, so I'm sort of catching up with myself. I'm only, does that make sense? Yeah, I'm only a little over a month afterwards. So this is a long day. I hope to make it all the way through if my voice holds out. All right. So... Yeah, so I'm revisiting the conversation between Paul and Holly when Holly is in the woods. And at some point in here, I don't know if I had a conversation with someone in real life or just a conversation with myself. And trying to make this more of the gut check scene for Holly. And I don't know if I'm going to accomplish it in this session of writing, but... I had talked about the, you know, bad guys close in, then all is lost, and then dark night of the soul, slash night of the dark soul. Um, but that's why I'm trying to get to, and it normally takes me several times through um, when I'm trying to reach a place that maybe is a little more emotionally impactful, a little deeper. I don't know if everyone's like this, but... It's really easy to write glib lines, to write exposition, to move the story ahead, but really to kind of get into a character and get them angry, get, you know, the drama, which isn't, you know, just surface melodrama, but is really sort of from the gut, from the heart. And so um, right now, as you see, Holly says, when I saw Rachel in that cabin with her smug, I'll take it from there, looks something told me I should stay. And then Paul says, I believe it's called motherly instinct. And then instead of trusting it, you fought it because blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to just read the dialogue. So that's kind of what I want to get at, but that's not how I want to say it. I've come back to that theme of motherly instinct several times because that was really something early on that I wanted to get to and wanted to get across that you know, the it's kind of the working from your heart instead of your head or vice versa, that she has come back sort of out of a sense of duty, obviously. Um, as Gary says at one point, did you come back to save Lexi or your reputation? And she really, not that she doesn't care about her reputation, but she did come back to save Lexi because she has feelings for her. I mean, in an aunt motherly sort of way. So that's what I'm trying to get to in that scene. And then this is the follow-up scene when Holly and Hogan are talking. And uh, if you disobey my turn on my badge, in that case, I'll be gone when you get here. So some of that rings true. Some of it, I think, is a little trite where she says, if you disobey him, I turn in my badge. Again, it's so hard to tell because you hear stuff like that all the time and it can work, especially in TV shows where they have the little snappy comebacks. And some people have accused me or I don't know of accused or just said that, yeah, that's sort of how you write in those little catchy things. It's like, oh, I can tell that's a Jack strip, a Jack script because, you know, whatever, which I guess... <laughs> If in one way, that's kind of a compliment and that could be good. But in another way, maybe it means that you really need to improve your writing. You meaning me. Um, glass, glass half empty much. That's right at the end of a scene. I think that's when Holly picks them up, right? And they're getting in the car. That still needs a little bit of tweaking. But again, everything feels like it's getting closer to being done. I mean, it's been 81 days of writing, which, I mean, let's face it, this baby is going to take several more days. It's easily going to be, well, a quarter of a year, right? 365 days, 91 times four is 364, I believe. So it's going to be more than a quarter of a year of writing in terms of days, which is pretty crazy. Um, so again, I think I still have this problem of Abby bringing up this Jewel B. McCallum 
airport when it's already been established that they think that's where they're going. So I still need to address that. Although, <laughs> having said that, now we have this montage or a series of shots, as I put it, traveling to Broken Bow. And so I've established that the utility van sort of has to make its way there going the slow way and the pickup truck that Holly is piloting, for lack of a better term, can take the more direct way. And we've established that obviously she can drive as fast as she wants. She's a good driver, etc. And I never really thought of that paying off, but I guess it sort of does here. Not that you have to be a wizard to speed, but, you know, she has experience with it. So... You know, I'm we're in the third act here, right? They're speeding toward where we assume some sort of, you know, showdown, not literally, but is going to take place. And there's only probably 16-ish, 17 pages left. So we're well into the third act. You know, the third act, according to good old Blake and Save the Cat, etc., starts with sort of gathering the team um, which I guess she does when she goes back to get Gary and Abby. Would you say that's gathering the team? And then, well, in this version, it doesn't appear that Hogan is going to be part of that team because she and he, they well, broken up isn't the right term, but they've, they've split apart. They're no longer driving together. Um, like they were before. So, you know, Lexi and Larry aren't on the team, although you could say that they're sort of messing with Rachel and the guys in the utility van. So in that way, they're sort of, but, you know, separate, but still on the team. I guess I could make that argument for myself. Okay. So they get to the airport and it's much more straightforward. There's none of that ace going to park, which I think I got rid of several versions ago, several drafts ago. So ace is like, all right, let's go. We'll wait for them because there's no plane here yet, but they're going to be here soon, we hope. We never really established, of course, where Salerno is coming from because I don't think it makes any difference. But... <laughs> You know, he couldn't have been super far away because he's going to get here relatively fast. And I'm not going to do the math on how fast the jet could fly, but he, he has to be somewhere within, I don't know, 500, six, seven, 800 miles or something. Um, okay, so Hogan shows up. Let's see. Yeah, so Hogan shows up, which is probably not a big surprise, but kind of, you know, a rah-rah moment, a happy moment. So they go to the, quote, fridge, and yeah, Hogan's line, the badge never fit me quite right. Jack, I see what you were going for when you wrote that, but that line has got to go. Leave a comment and see if you agree. Share, subscribe, like. And then tell all your friends about it, about my YouTube channel. But yeah, that the badge never fit me quite right. Is I don't I don't like that. It, it's almost hard for me to read. Um. Anyways, so he's got some more goodies in his trunk. Although I kind of need to rethink that because they have rifles. And there's no reason that Holly still wouldn't have her rifle with her. And she gave one to Hogan. And certainly they wouldn't break in that trunk just to get out the monocular. Um, so I think there could be some more firepower in there. Um, so this is, you know, the part about Holly wondering if Rachel knows about them. And they say, we don't think she does or we're pretty sure she doesn't. That didn't really change much. And then this conversation that Abby and Gary have while watching Hogan and Holly. Um, <laughs> early on, and not really, I mean, for quite a while, it has survived. And it, it seemed kind of like a good idea, clever idea, 
that instead of hearing a conversation, we hear two other people saying what they assume the two are talking about. And um, it's kind of gone through some iterations. I'm not super in love with it at this point. So we, because this is Act 3, we're, we're moving pretty fast, so we don't have to see like Gary getting all ready. At first I was going to have more bulletproof vest, but then I realized that would make him more bulky, and even if Ace and Clyde see him at a distance, they may be more inclined not to believe that that was Larry. So I, I kind of got rid of that, and basically, you know, we don't hear the whole plan, but the plan is that Gary's going to go sneak up there, make his appearance, I mean, if you've been watching and reading, you know what's going to happen. All right. Uh, so the plane is almost there. Just reading here. So this is... I cut a little out. See, look at my page count right now, 113 pages. Do you see that in the bottom right? I don't know. Wow. Wow. I guess all that stuff in the woods and the montage getting down there and blah, blah, blah. I didn't realize they had added that many pages. So <laughs> the truth is, I don't know if, if anyone or how many people look at the page count as they go. Obviously, this is after your script is complete. When you're first starting writing, there's really no sense in looking at it. Although you do want to have, you know, your catalyst inciting incident by page 10 or 12 so maybe that's not unreasonable but as I'm writing I will sometimes look down and look at that and I say eh, I got to cut out six pages or wow I need to add a few pages um, that's kind of a silly thing to think but sometimes I do all right well this is the exposure the better so I'm gonna find a chair so now Larry has got a um, and again, this isn't brand new stuff. I've written this several times, but Larry's going to make his, oh, he's going to make his pitch to go to the bathroom. So I'm still playing with the idea of, of uh, Larry and to some extent Lexi messing with Ace and Clyde. But, well, again, I think in, in Act 3, this is just total speculation, but when you think about it, in any sort of movie, maybe with action, suspense, the thriller or something, I would guess that Act 3 has the least amount of dialogue of any of the three acts, right? Act 1... Maybe has the most, maybe not. Act two certainly has a fair share, but I would say in general, the less dialogue Act three has, well, that's not true. I was going to say the less it has, the better, but if it's a movie that lends itself to more dialogue, but something where the action is building up, I'm just thinking of various movies, um, Certainly, you would think that dialogue would have more of a tendency to slow it down than to speed it up. But I'm just rambling here. So I've jumped all the way ahead to... What in the... Beep? Oh. I'm kind of copying and pasting stuff into here, I think. Grab sorry. What page am I on? I'm page 94. Huh. So. Oh, yeah. So now I, I'm trying to work in the part alluding to the fact that Clyde thinks she may have been killed or that. Um, and then I obviously just changed it almost immediately. 
should be any minute. So I still have that idea that Lexi sort of learned from Holly kind of how to handle herself when she grabs Rachel's wrists, wrist and twists it. And then Rachel tries to turn it back on her by saying, remember that as in to respect your elders. Okay, so Larry's in the bathroom. Again, this oh, never fails. I record after 9.30 or 9 and I start yawning. Um, but this is sort of relating to that whole idea of twins ESP that Larry goes in there maybe on his own, but then he gets a sense or whatever you want to call it. Or maybe he literally sees Gary because I think maybe he does. But what led him to go into the bathroom? Did he really have to take a leak or not? So I'm sort of rushing through this, not rushing through, but I'm not making a lot of changes. Um, so here comes the airplane or the jet. Then we get rid of Get rid of that line and just change it. You know, Larry says, do I have time to take a leak? And of course, all of these planes are going to have bathrooms on them. So there's no reason that these guys, Clyde and Ace, couldn't have said no. But it sure worked out well that they said yes. Although, I don't know, you could still argue that they're plan of having Gary outside could possibly work, although it would have been a lot harder if Larry had been just standing there the whole time. But again, hopefully people will cut me some slack because they'll be so into the movie that they'll excuse a few things like that. Okay, so now I'm just trying to tighten things up. I'm still at 113 pages and I want to definitely be like, be below 110. Okay. Just kind of scrolling through. It's funny how I'll just go in and look at some action slash direction and just make a little change to it. Just because I think of a way to word it better. Oh, look at that. I got rid of some more stuff. Or... To finish that thought, you know, something changes in the story that necessitates a change in the action direction. Sometimes it's just a matter of coming up with a better, more succinct way to say it. So you can save those important pages. See, I'm already down to 112. So, yeah, and so Act 3, according to Save the Cat, or actually Save the Cat Strikes Back, I think he got like gathering the team, storming the gates. Um, what is that next one called? It's like the tables that have turned the um, the surprise, the the high tower surprise. I think they call it, and then dig down deep, and then execute the new plan. So, yeah, in relation to that, in relation to this, as I said, gathering the team is, well, I mean, right now it's got to be Holly getting the two kids and then Hogan. I think that would count as they get to the airport. Executing the plan is obvious when um, Gary goes up there and then it seems to work. And so the Hightower surprise... I got to think about that because when Salerno comes out, he and, uh, you know, he talks to Holly first, obviously, he talks to Hogan for a second. But the main conversation he really has is with Lexi. So you could you could argue the high, high tower surprise is what happens in the course of their conversation. It's not really action. You could also argue possibly, and I thought about this as I was writing it, when Rachel pulls her gun out to really prove that she does have power, you know, literal power, because she's got a gun. And I don't know that uh, Lexi certainly wasn't expecting it. Holly may or may not have. And then, of course, she comes in 
and I'm getting ahead of myself a little, but she comes in when Holly goes in to see Hogan after we think everything is fine because Salerno has left and Rachel's got the gun and then they have the little struggle for it. And again, I didn't want to make that a big woman on woman MMA crazy thing. So I, I leaving it, I'm leaving it fairly simple, but that could be considered that high tower surprise. And then of course, is there really enough time for dig down deep? I'm just thinking of other movies. And I, I certainly see those steps more than in this. I mean, dig down deep could just be Holly ending up punching <laughs> Rachel in the face and then executing the new plan. There's really not much of a new plan because the movie is basically over here. So I'd have to go back and think. Um, think about all of those steps in my third act because I feel like the third act it typically is the shortest in any given movie and this one I would definitely say it's it's relatively short it's probably uh, I'd have to go back and look but it, I mean if if this is going to end up being 106 pages the third act should be 25 26, 27 pages and minutes, a.k.a. minutes. And I don't think it's more than 25. I have to go back and look, as I said. Um, I don't think I haven't really been even looking at my script as I've been talking these last several minutes. But I do like that idea when Rachel says, all you had to do is not come back. And Holly basically says, what she's going to say, because I've got the blue highlight over there, is something similar, right? All you had to do is not come back. Well, I seem to have left the script, and now what's going on here? Huh. I don't know what prompted me to go back and change this dialogue. Everything in surplus would be no. What's yours? I honestly don't know. Gosh, it's funny how I sometimes rewrite an entire bit and it doesn't appear to be any reason to. Sometimes it could be that, oh, wait a minute, maybe it's this airport part. There's no response. So he turns to her search. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so. Now I've gone back even farther. I'm trying to fix the part about the airport. Keep going. I'm going to redo this. I remember working on this. Uh, oh, but I guess not too hard. All right, put one in her. So I did conclude that those two guys know that, you know, it's not that it's Holly, but it's a woman. A couple more. We're going to play 20 questions. All right, so I'm still working on this scene. Let's see if I change any dialogue here. Oh, all right, I changed this. See what you think. Oh, no, what happened? Yeah, number one, that's question one. Yeah, there's question two. What do you think? I kind of like that. I kind of like that. All right, now... I think I'm revisiting this conversation. Let's see if I am doing that. Because I'm trying to get more, not visceral, I'm trying to get deeper into Holly's psyche. Not psyche, what am I even thinking of? This is going to be her all is lost moment. That is what I'm, I'm sort of getting, um, I'm trying to get to. And for me, that's usually not easy because not me personally, but 
my characters seem to live more on the surface than they do like super deep and complex and stuff like that. And there's definitely a difference between writing, you know, conflict and drama on one level and then really getting down to the gut wrenching stuff on the other level. And that's, there hasn't really been too much of that in this. I mean, you could argue there has or hasn't been any or maybe more, whatever. But I'm trying to get to there in this scene because I really want Holly to get to a place where she does feel that either all is lost or I'm helpless or I didn't realize what I thought I knew or something. So let's just see what I'm doing here with the dialogue. That's the reason I'm not so I still have her line of when I saw Rachel in that cabin. But I don't know if that's too on the nose, Paul's motherly instinct thing. And then explaining it right afterwards. So no, you thought I still do, but not as bad as saving Lexi. But you thought it because it stood in the way of what you thought you wanted. Hmm, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I think I, whoop. Welcome to the wonderful world of parenting. Yeah. So I'm, I'm cutting this. I'm down to page 111, but it's still not quite there, in my opinion. And that's all that counts, is your opinion, right? When you're writing something. Obviously, you get feedback and all that, but. All right. Um, yeah, this still needs some tweaking. Just It just feels like too much dialogue there. I need to cut this and make it go faster. And I did cut a little bit out right there. In that case, I'll be gone when you get here. Um, that may be really the end of the scene. All right, let's see. Am I going to... Excuse me. So Rachel is helping Lexi sort of recall that night. Lexi's line, it was the start of a new life. This feels like the end of it. Eh, technically true. Not a huge fan of that line, but it's not bad. Oh, but wait, I'm changing it. I started my, the night they separated us, I started my new life and now we're still Yeah, that's not working because Rachel's got two lines in a row. Yeah, I remember changing that line of Gary's from it to the truck or that to the truck to make that more clear. So I'm really just going through and kind of cleaning things up. With my eye on the page count, probably. decide to come uh, I still don't like that line about the badge not fitting me right your time she tells her knowing um, <laughs> I've rewritten I've rewritten I've rewritten this scene I don't know how many times and as I've said sometimes that's a sign that either it needs substantial work. It needs to be start from the top and write that scene over. Sometimes it means you got to get rid of it. Okay. Gosh, I'm really jumping around here. Remember, teams is from the Fed in the ground. Super yawn. Guys, he borrowed it from. expecting wow so I guess I just I don't know what prompted me to go back and make these changes or little fixes take her home Solero two rifles against one for militiamen I'm not sure if militiamen is how I want to really uh, label them because that doesn't seem very mob like Abby, at one point I had um, Gary doing the shooting, but I I think, I don't think I just changed that now. I thought 
you know, she was the one who got the lesson, so why not let her take the shots? And again, she's not becoming the hero or the heroine. She's just uh, distracting them, which obviously could help to some extent. I like that. Could have you turn this into any more of a cluster? He doesn't have to drop any F-bombs for us to know what he's talking about. Whenever he can avoid swearing, I like to. As I've said way many episodes ago, for the most part, it's a crutch. Um, it's easy thing to say to either get a reaction or a laugh or a whatever. And, uh, you know, some people swear all the time just in their daily walk and conversation, but not me. And so I try to keep it to a minimum. And of course, you always, I mean, if you're considering ratings, possibly of your movie, which you shouldn't necessarily do when you're writing, maybe, but whoops, sorry. Uh, it's something that I mostly keep in mind. I mean, I see this as a PG-13 type thing or a TV MA or a, I don't know, whatever those things are. So now what I'm trying to do here and what I've been trying to do since I started writing this part is make it believable that Salerno would react like this, that, Le that Lexi would react like this, because this is kind of the crux of the whole thing. And you know, it doesn't directly involve Holly, so that might be a little bit weird. She's there, and, you know, she's taking an active part, but she's not part of this discussion. Although, she isn't verbally, but certainly the reason Lexi is saying what she is is because, in large part, because of Holly and, and of course, her friends. Um, and I think I mentioned this before, the idea that... Uh, could could Lexi really talk this mob boss, king, mob family, whatever guy into not taking her? Because if you can't make that believable, then you've got a problem. The good news is, I can't tell you what the good news is yet, I don't think. Um, but I'm getting close to being to be able to tell you what the good news is. Excuse me. So, yeah, so now I think I, I've added this part where uh, Lexi actually goes and they don't know if she's going to go get on the plane, if she's going to meet him halfway, literally. Um, I don't. So by this time, you know, she's pretty much as it is written, she's pretty much already won and he's she's just kind of giving him the consolation prize of going up and giving her a hug. And so, yeah, there it is. And it's not 100% done yet, but hopefully that's believable. And it's a nice twist that it's not a big shootout and he's not a super creep. Super creep. Uh, and I think I mentioned that last time we talked about this scene. I'm surprised I have to re rewrite all this because I thought I kind of had this written. Oh, good. I'm getting rid of some stuff. What's best for my granddaughter? See, is that too cheesy? Again, it's so hard to say because it's all, it's not all in the delivery because if you have a total crap line, it's going to be hard to deliver. And even if it's delivered well, it doesn't mean it's the right line for the movie, which is always the tricky part. Um, cause when you write a novel, everyone who reads it, not literally, but everyone who reads it is going to interpret the things, the way they hear the conversation playing out based on the character in a screenplay, the reader or the, you know, producer, director, actor who is reading the script may have their own interpretation. But in the end, the vast majority of the people who see it, AKA the audience, um, are going to hear it as directed by the director and as spoken by the actor. So that's why sometimes good lines of dialogue 
turn out not so good. And that's why sometimes stuff that seems cheesy, maybe when you read it and then you hear it and you're like, wow, that that totally worked out. Or someone has a, a long speech and you read the screenplay and you go, how are they going to justify that? And then the person delivers it and boo, it knocks you out. So that is another thing that makes screenwriting the hardest. I'm going to say it again if I had not already, and I think I did, but the hardest form of writing says me, all right, what have I been working on while I've been talking here? So Rachel is pretty much lost at this point, and her desperation is showing. What about me? Wait, she wants to still go with Vic, get on the plane, etc., um, but she spots her handbag, foreshadowing, which you already know if you've read and been with me on these previous days, unless something changes. Maybe I've completely rewritten the next scene. So Holly's going to check up on Hogan. Gosh, I'm so apologetic of my yawns. I'm trying to tighten this up a little too, because we don't need to know, you know, totally all this crap. We just need to know that Hogan is alive. He's going to make it. You know, he wasn't shot that bad. Um, and that Holly is, you know, thinking or not thinking, but wants to get him to the hospital and because she thinks everything is over here. And then Hogan reveals that he is called Noble. And uh, Holly, not too excited about that. And so she's going to get away, or she's going to uh, slip away. You want to ride the car? I don't need Noble's on his way, does he? I'm not sure. Yeah, so I, yeah, that, that's a lot better. We can jump right ahead to that. Uh, Rachel comes. <laughs> Not in a good headspace. So this, this, I think this dialogue needs to be shortened. Let's see if I realize that. Oh, watch, watch this. Boom. Down to 109 pages. You got bigger problems than that. So, yeah, I, I don't even know the dialogue I had because I just erased it. But there was quite a bit quite a bit there at this point we just want to see i mean what everyone wants to see is holly beat up rachel right that's pure and simple so i don't want to prolong the scene because i mean pretty much people know what's going to happen it's just how are you going to get there and i mean really you're just five minutes from the end of the movie so not a whole lot is going to happen there um so the, again, we cut before the gunshot goes off. We hear, we catch a little bit of outside activity, lighting, lightening the mood with that Lamborghini line. And then bang, then they run in. All right, kidnapping and attempted murder. U.S. Marshal, no less. So what am I doing here? I'm cutting. Get out of here. Whoop. So I guess I kind of skipped by the part where she punched, where Holly punched her in the face. Book ends. Yes, that was me yawning. Gosh. I have to make a vow not to record these after 9 o'clock at night, apparently. Um, so yeah, Holly and Hogan are having this little back and forth about going on a date of some sort. I'm pretty sure you owe me dinner. Yeah, so I, I kind of like that, um, because that goes back to the, the thing that Holly told him before she jumped out of his car. Then yawn just in. 
I'll do you one better. So now we're getting into the um, final scene ish. And so what do we have? 109 pages. We're on 105, 106. So we've got like four pages, four minutes. And can the, the movie really sustain that much? uh stuff as sort of the the resolution and you know do you have to tie up all the loose ends i've i've talked about that before whether you really do you can leave some to the audience's imagination because there's nothing worse than some exciting happening big whatever the the good guys win and then you spend five six seven minutes discussing it debriefing what happened it's more like People can figure that out if they really want to on their way home from the theater or after they turn off the TV, preferably the theater. But TVs are pretty nice, too. Beggars can't be choosers. Um, but this is probably too long. Looks over Justice Martinez. Okay, so um, Paul and Holly have not talked since he called her when she was in the woods and, you know, getting shot at and stuff. So this is Paul's sort of, I mean, he's got to come back as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I am changing a few things here. Final goodbyes. So he's there already. Holly, da, 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 da. Paul sits talking on the phone. All right, so sorry. Paul is there. He's talking to someone. Turns out to be uh, Justice Martinez. <sighs> All right, now this part about her having an 18-year-old daughter. Have I mentioned that before? Was that in an earlier piece of dialogue? I think it was. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to play with this dialogue quite a bit till I get at what I think is right. And all in the name of brevity, brevity, brevity. Kind of ironic to say brevity three times. That line about I don't need protection but still want an ant. I may have mentioned one of my son's suggested something along those lines. That's kind of where that came from. All right, I need to shorten this up. I need to shorten this up. Oh, look at that. Got rid of my uncle. Still at 109 pages. Watch this. Boom. 108 pages. So, yeah, this part about her mom, uh, again, it's a loose end. Does it need to be tied up? I mean, they left her having gotten punched out, shooting at an FBI or a U.S. Marshal. So is she going back to jail? Probably, if someone presses charges. Possibly not. But... Yeah, right now I'm trying to tie that up, but... Spoiler alert, might not last. All right, they need to go, meaning Holly needs to go with him. Lexi gives the all-important Aunt Holly line, because that's going to uh, kind of another bookend thing that's going to have a payoff, the final payoff. Whoop, here I am back on page four. What am I changing? It's crazy how I went from nearly the end back way back here. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Uh, so the idea, of course, is that uh, Justice Martinez, because she has an 18-year-old daughter or whatever, son or daughter, when she found out why Holly went back, all is forgiven. 
And uh, so Holly lives happily ever after working for the justice, although she'll be back for the sequel. No, she'll be back probably to hang out with Lex a little bit. Ooh, I'm on page 108. So I'm right now I'm even cutting this. If you consider the data stuff. So a little back and forth between them. And there we go. Day 81 in the bag. It was a long one. So I'm not going to talk anymore except to say see you tomorrow because there's still more writing to do on a screenwriter's journey.